Let's look at mercy. Um, I want to look at, the, I want to spend tonight, and, and maybe part of next week, depending on how far we get, looking at how mercy is defined in Scripture. You know, So notice I didn't go to dictionaries, I didn't go to psychological dictionaries, and so on. Not that there isn't good literature there, but let's, how did the Old Testament, the Jewish Scriptures define it, and then how does Jesus define mercy? and so on, and then we want to take that when we look at the year of mercy. What is mercy? Okay. I want to begin with um, a little bit of Old Testament background, and particularly the work of Walter Brueggemann, a wonderful Protestant scripture scholar, now retired. And those of you who remember back about 2002, Walter spoke here, um, actually spoke here twice. Um, so wonderful, he even looks like an Old Testament prophet. Okay, okay. <laughs> But Brueggemann has done some, some, some very important work in the Old Testament. And, and now, this is what I'm going to give, share with you, has wider, wider implications than just mercy. He really poses something here. Brueggemann said, you know, if you, if you go to the, the Old Testament, or also go to the New Testament afterwards, and you read it with this question in mind, whoever is writing this book, how did they understand the essence of religion? Okay, we're Christians in this room, you know. What's the essence of Christianity? What's the essence of any religion? What's the essence of, uh, of religion? Okay. Well, he said in the, in the Old Testament, you're going to find three answers, not one. Okay. Depends who's writing. Okay. And depends when they're writing. So Bergman said if you read the early books of the Old Testament, Deuteronomy, Exodus, Numbers, you're going to see that at that point in Judaism, they understood the essence of religion as proper entry and proper practice. What made you a good Jew? Well, you had to be circumcised, you had to be born, you know, there had to be proper entrance or some kind of baptism, and you had to practice as a Jew. You know, you had to keep the Sabbath, you had to keep all these laws, and there's many laws. In fact, the Book of Numbers, they codify these laws, and it got right down to how you boil milk and whether you can boil meat in milk and so on. What does a woman have to do when she's menstruating? And those rules, they get really minute at a certain point. And see, to be a good Jew, you have to belong to the Jewish community and you have to obey all those rules. The major ones being the Ten Commandments. So if you asked a person in Deuteronomy, what makes you a good Jew? They would have said, proper entry, proper practice. I practice the law. I keep the law. So it was a person of keeping the law, proper church practice. Now that held sway until the prophets came along. So the great prophets come along and they completely blow this out of the water. Okay. So the prophets come along and they say, you know something? God doesn't care about how you boil milk. <laughs> and God couldn't care about all this stuff and kosher and so on. They said, you know what God cares about? He said, God cares about the poor. That's where you get this first powerful justice motif. So Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Joel, they come out and say, God is a God for the poor. And proper religious practice is taking care of the poor. In fact, they have a mantra, which is still worth memorizing. The prophet says, the quality of your faith is going to be judged by the quality of justice in the land. And the quality of justice in the land will always be judged by how three, the three weakest groups Widows, orphans, strangers. That's code in scripture. Widows, orphans, strangers. That's the three weakest group in your society. When you come to the judgment day, you're going to be judged by how they fared when you were alive. Notice it. So you're going to be religiously judged by how the poor fare. That's the prophets. You know? Notice in there, they didn't seem to be concerned about whether you kept kosher and all this and so on. But that's not where the Old Testament ends. After the prophets come to wisdom figures, that's the Psalms and so on. The wisdom figures come along and say, you know what's more important than church practice? And you know what's more important than taking care of the poor? How you do it. And they said, the essence of religion is to have a wise, merciful heart. See, they insert the word mercy. You know what God wants from you? God wants from you to have a wise, merciful heart. Then you'll do proper church practice and you'll take care of the poor and so on. She so says, so that the essence... See, incidentally, this still works today. You know, in, in all churches today, we have three kinds of Christians. We have Deuteronomy Christians, and they're convinced that 
The most important thing is proper church practice. Are you going to church? Are you keeping the rules? And so on. We have uh, prophetic Christians who they think the most important thing is justice, justice, justice. And we have wisdom Catholics. And these are the Thomas Keatings and the, so on to say, meditation, prayer, <laughs> and so on. You know, and oftentimes, ironically, those three peeps, a lot of times they don't get along. <laughs> no, in all churches, there's great tension between these three. That's true. In the Catholic Church today, in Protestant churches, there's, there's a huge tension between these three. You know, and it's true in all churches, in religion and so on. Um, it's true in Islam, it's true in Ju Judaism and so on. Um, but see, that tension is already clear in the Old Testament. For some Old Testament people, to be a, the essence of religion is proper practice. For some, it's taking care of the poor. And for others, it is um, to have a wise, compassionate heart. Wait, those of you who pray the Psalms, okay, and uh, is it up there? Yeah. Um, th those of you who pray the Psalms, um, Somehow I missed something here. Okay. Yeah, it's on the bottom. Okay. Um, you, know, you know how often this comes up? And it, it, it's translated in different ways in the English scriptures, where they say, I, wa I don't want sacrifice, I want mercy. Or I don't want sacrifice, I want compassion. And, and the Hebrew word there is the word hesed. And, uh, and it, it's a, it, it, there's an interesting background to that word, you know. Hasid was a word they used for family relationships. And it, it, it was a relationship that went beyond justice. So let me give you a simple example. Imagine you owe your banker, you owe your bank $200, okay? That's a relationship of justice. And the banker is not going to forgive you, okay? If you owe your brother or your sister $200, they might say, this is Hasid inside the family, write it off. See, so you don't, you don't keep justice books inside of a family, you know. And God said, that's what I want from you. You know, I want you to uh, relate to each other as brothers and sisters in which the rules of economic justice and payback and revenge, they don't apply, you know. Inside of families, you forgive, you forget, you let go, and so on. And so they use that word, hasid, the word for mercy. Okay, now. We have this tension in the Old Testament. Jesus comes along. What does Jesus do with that? Well, what he, Jesus does what he does with everything else. He makes it infinitely more complex yet. <laughs> so he ratifies all three, you know. Um, you know, if, if <laughs> little footnote, if you're going to Jesus for, for easy answers, you haven't discovered Jesus. <laughs> you know, I was at a talk this summer in Toronto by Young Shade and Claire Bo Claiborne, whom we're trying to get here for our summer institute. And he's this wonderful young evangelical who works with the poor in uh, the streets of Philadelphia, but worked with Mother Teresa for lots of years. And he, he began his lecture this way. He said, you know, I always read these stories of people who say, you know, my life was messed up. My whole life was messed up. He said, then I discovered Jesus. And now oh, my life is together. He said, I laugh. He said, my life was together. Then I discovered Jesus. <laughs> Jesus doesn't set your life together. Jesus messes it up. John Shea said he was teaching in Chicago one time. This young Jesus person gave up and says, you know, Father said, H have you met Jesus Christ? And John said, unfortunately, yes. <laughs> okay. See, Jesus, remember Jesus said, I don't bring peace into the world. I bring fire, you know. See, so that, okay, now here, it's interesting. Jesus ratifies all three of these. So there's times in, in the Gospels where Jesus says, if anybody loves me, they'll keep my word. I'll always give you one example of this many. So Jesus says, religion is about proper practice. And the, the New Testament, John, the, letter, the epistle of John says, if anybody says they love God but don't keep the commandments, John says, you're a liar. So you can't be loving God and breaking the commandments. So Jesus says, well, the essence of religion is proper practice, except... <laughs> He comes along at different places and he says, the essence of religion is how you treat the poor. In fact, that text in Matthew 25 can be one of the most singly scary texts in all of scripture. And that's the famous text, you know the text by heart, where whatsoever you do, remember? Whatsoever you do to least my brother, you do to me. But he was answering a question. And the question was, what is gonna be the question at the final judgment? 
when you stand before God with the great test, what's the real test? What are you going to be questioned on at the final judgment? So he sets it up as a judgment scene. So Jesus says, this is the way the last judgment's going to work. The king's going to come out, set up a throne, and they're going to divide the people, sheep to the right, goats to the left, and there's going to be one set of questions. Did you feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, visit prisoners, visit the sick? He said, well, what about church stuff? Did you go to church? What about the sixth commandment, sex? What about all this stuff? It isn't asked. He said there's going to be one set of questions. Did you feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty? It's Jesus. I always tell priests, you know, if you went on a, on a Sunday homily and preached it just the way it was taught, you'd be in the bishop's office Monday morning. <laughs> you know, when you, say, when you die, you stand before God, it's only going to be one set of questions. And notice they're not catechetical questions, but it's a question. Did you feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked? Well, what about all this other stuff? At that point, he doesn't say anything. One student said, how did Jesus get away with that? I said, he didn't. They killed him. <laughs> <laughs> He, he wasn't called into the bishop's office, you know. Okay. A little, little story, a colleague of mine says, he likes preaching his priest, said, he always tells people, he said, so Jesus says, you who did it, you come with me to the kingdom for everlasting happiness, and you who didn't, divide into small groups. <laughs> okay. Interesting, a little footnote in this. Notice that neither group knew what they were doing. The group who did it right didn't know what they were doing. Remember, they say, we didn't know we were doing it for you. Jesus said, it doesn't matter. You did it. And the group who didn't do it right said, had we known, <laughs> we would have done it. Doesn't matter. In Matthew's gospel, mature discipleship is not so much whether you consciously work for Jesus or whatever. It's are you doing it right? And one of the things is the justice thing. But now Jesus doesn't end there either. He comes along with his own wisdom sayings. And at key points of the gospel, we're going to look at this text later on tonight, where Jesus says, be compassionate as your heavenly Father is compassionate. You know, the deepest part of the gospel. Now, it's interesting, a little footnote here. Um, <clears throat> in some English Bibles, or not just in English Bibles, in Matthew and Mark, Matthew and Mark write it this way, where say, Jesus says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. It's Luke who says, be compassionate as your Heavenly Father is compassionate. Now, it's actually the same concept, except here I'm going to give you a little bit of a, we need some, some, some translation here. See, all of us in this room, I suspect, maybe, maybe not all of us, but everybody who grew up in a Western language, English, Spanish, French, whatever, and so on, um, see, the software we think in is Greek. And see, so for us, the word perfection means Precisely, perfection means no blemishes. See, a perfect complexion has no blemishes. A perfect body would have no blemishes whatsoever. See, so a perfect moral life would have no blemishes. So if Jesus says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, if you understand that in the Greek sense, which we do, it's impossible to do. We cannot be perfect. Except the Bible wasn't written by Aristotle. If it was, that's what it would mean. It was written in Greek, but with Hebrew thought. And in Hebrew, the word perfection is synonymous with the word compassion. So that, in fact, Luke simply gives it a word. So, in fact, Jesus is not saying be perfect as your father is perfect. He says be compassionate the way your heavenly father is compassionate. Be merciful. And you see, that's the deep center of the gospel, you know. Be merciful as your heavenly father is merciful. And we're going to tease that out afterwards. That's quite a line. Be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful. Um, let me say a little bit about that. No, notice what he's... Um, um, we, we oftentimes don't remember the subordinate clause. Jesus says, be merciful, be compassionate, and he doesn't say, as is defined in the Dictionary of Psychological Health. <laughs> or be compassionate the way Eric Fromm defines it or the way Rollo May defines it, or the way the encyclopedia defines it, and so on. He says, be compassionate the way your heavenly Father is compassionate. Then he's going to say one of the most stunning things in all of Scripture. He said, be compassionate the way your heavenly Father is compassionate, because God the Father lets his Son, 
the sun here is the sun in the sky, not the sun, Jesus. He said, God lets his sun shine on the bad as well as the good, the righteous and the unrighteous alike. Now he's saying this. He says, you know the way God loves? God loves the way the sun shines. And the sun is completely non-discriminatory. When the sun shines, it shines on vegetables and weeds evenly. The sun doesn't say, you know, vegetables are good and weeds are bad. The sun just shines and the vegetables drink in the sun and the weeds drink in the sun. Jesus says, God just loves. And he loves bad people. He loves good people. God loves the saints in heaven and God loves the devils in hell. God loves Mary, the mother of Jesus, and God loves Lucifer and loves them evenly. Now they respond differently, <laughs> you know. And God's energy goes out. And some people use the energy of God for wonderful things, like Mother Teresa is going to be canonized this weekend. Some of them use it for the most horrific things that you can imagine. It's God's energy. See, God just shines, and God loves everybody evenly. God loves pro-life, and God loves pro-choice, and God loves both Hillary and Donald Trump. And God loves Republicans and Democrats. And not only that, God says, and you have to too. Remember, be compassionate the way God is compassionate. Love the way God loves. And God loves everybody indiscriminately. He said, that's the task. And remember, Jesus is going to say, don't just love your friends. Don't just love good people. You've got to love your enemies. You've got to love bad people. I said that in a church once in Austin. And a guy stood up and said, that's the most wishy-washy thing I've ever heard in my life, you know? <laughs> I said, well, take it up with Jesus, okay? <laughs> because that's pretty clear in, in Scripture, you know? And it's, it's one of the incredible challenges of Scripture. You're going to see it. I don't want to try to tease some of this out tonight. Like, Jesus stretches us further, to my mind, than any moral teacher, psychological teacher ever, you know? Um, remember, he said, it's not good enough just to love those who love you. It's not good enough just to love the Democrats and not the Republicans, the Republicans and not the Democrats. It's not good enough to love pro-life and not love pro-choice. It's not good enough to love Christians and not love Muslims. It's not good enough to love Muslims and not Arab, Hindus and everybody else. It's not good enough just to love good people. You've got to love bad people. And you see, you love them the same. Now, you're going to see, that's one of the, the challenges, which is also why God can be merciful. <laughs> Okay, but I want to conclude this little section here. See, so Jesus comes along, and he doesn't pick between these three. Jesus doesn't say, well, in the end, religion's about practice, or in the end, religion's about wisdom and compassion, or in the end, religion's about justice, and religion is about all three, you know. Um, join your prayer group, join your justice group, and join your church group. It's interesting, you know, that's what you see in great Christians. You know, um, Dorothy Day, who's going to be the first lady, American-born, um, canonized. Notice Dorothy Day. Dorothy Day could lead the rosary, and she could lead the peace march. Most people can't do it. <laughs> they can lead the peace march. They can't lead the rosary. Some people can lead the rosary. They can't lead the peace march. Some people can do this, but they can't do that. Jesus says, you want to try all three of these. You want to have proper practice. You want to keep the commandments. You want to feed the poor. You want to be a person of justice, and you want to be a person with a wise, compassionate, merciful heart. Okay. Now, this is a little background. I want to look at some gospel illustrations of this. Okay. And, and I picked 12 of these um, just, just that, 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 act, that illustrate mercy. Okay. And the first one I'm just going to give to you as an image. I'm not going to dwell on it very long and so on. But it's that powerful gospel text of Luke 15. Um, See, Luke, Luke 15 has three parables in a row, okay? Uh, and all three of them make the same, um, and it's really the chapter of mercy. If you want to pull one chapter out of the entire New Testament, this is the chapter of mercy. Take Luke 15, okay? And these are the three, three parables. Jesus says, no. <clears throat> what shepherd, if he has 99, 100 sheep, and if he loses one, doesn't leave the 99 in the desert, in the wilderness. Now, notice he's not leaving them in a very good place, you know, and goes and he finds the stray. And when he finds the stray, he brings it back on his shoulder. 
He said, because there's more rejoicing in heaven over one stray that's brought back than over 99 who don't need repentance. Okay. Then the second parable, he said, there's a woman with 10 coins, and she loses a coin. And we're going to look at that story in some detail later. And she goes ballistic, looking for this coin. She's lost this dime. The coin's only worth a dime, you know. She sweeps the house, puts on lamps, and eventually she finds the coin. She's so overjoyed that she throws a party and calls in all her neighbors. And that's this huge party. Probably spend more than all ten coins are worth because she found her lost coin. And then the famous parable that gets most of the ink. A father had two sons. And the younger son took his inheritance, went off to a foreign land, spent it on prostitutes and drinking and so on, then fell on hard times. He comes back. And the father runs out to meet him. Notice that the son doesn't even get a chance to give his, 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 his apology speech. Embraces him, said, get the best slippers, the best robe, kill the fattest calf, put the ring on his finger. It's going to be a feast. My son has come back. And then the older son is in the field. He hears this. He comes home. and He's angry. He's angry because the fuss now is about the younger son. And he won't go in the house. But the father comes out. And he begs the son to come in the house. Incidentally, if you understand Jewish literature and Jewish scripture, that is where Jesus really, um, it's surprising for Jewish authors. See, if you read the Old Testament, there are so many stories where the younger one gets it and the older one just is shuttled off. You know, it starts with Abraham between Isaac and the other son. Isaac gets the inheritance, the other son's. Rachel and, 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 um, and Leah, you know, Jacob falls in love with, with Rachel. He dumps Leah, <laughs> you know, and see, and they never get back to the younger one, you know. Um, see here, in, in, in classical Jewish religious literature, the, the father wouldn't have come out for the older son. It's all about the younger son. But here, no, Jesus is both sons. See, he's a father. He's got to get both kids in the house, you know. The woman... You know, um, let me do just a little symbolism on that. See, no, notice the numbers in there, you know. He said, somebody has 100 sheep and they lose one. They leave the 99 and go after the one. That's not very wise to do. Notice you are rolling the dice on, a, on 99 <laughs> for the sake of the one. See, that, that, that wouldn't be very prudential. You could lose all 99 getting the one. But th th this is the deal. It's to do with numbers and wholeness. In Judaism, 100 is a whole number, and 99 is not a whole number. And so that, uh, see, it's not so much the value of the one sheep, it's the value of wholeness. This, this shepherd, he's got to get everybody together. And it's the same with the woman at the 10 coins. The dime isn't worth much, but 10 is a whole number, and 9 is not. I once heard a wonderful homily by John Shea on this. John Shea says, you know, you could recast that story of the woman. He says, you could cast it this way. There was a mother who had 10 children, and it was Thanksgiving. And nine of the kids were home at the table, and they were enjoying themselves. But the mother was conscious that one wasn't home. <laughs> and she's hovering around the telephone, hoping this kid would ring. Or the, and then, you know, halfway through the meal, the wayward daughter isn't home. She rings the mother, and then they talk a little bit. Then the mother comes. Now she can celebrate. No, it's whole. See, a family isn't whole if there's somebody missing. And the same with the father. See, he has two sons. He's trying to get them both in the house. Okay, and the house represents heaven. He's trying to get him into the father's home, and finally he gets one in, and he's outside, <laughs> begging the other one. See, the family has to be whole, so that. Um, but but. And it's, it's to do with mercy and rolling the dice for mercy. So Luke 15, it's, it's the preeminent chapter of mercy in Scripture. Okay? And we're, we're, we're all familiar with that, that, just that powerful image of the prodigal son, um, which incidentally, Scripture scholars say, you shouldn't call that the parable of the prodigal son. It should be called the parable of the prodigal father. See, it's the father who's really prodigal. You know, he... he that's not the way a father should act. You know, he threw away his dignity, his money, everything out of mercy and love for the son. See, so it's, it's, this is really a story about God. And, and those of you, if you haven't seen it or read the book, uh, look at that famous painting by Rembrandt, you know, 
and uh, which Henry now wrote that incredible book on called The Return of the Prodigal Son. You know? See, so this is ultimately a story about God and God's mercy, not so much about the two boys who are, you know, one is out of the house out of weakness, one is out of the house out of anger, they're both out of the house. But the story is about the father, the father trying to get his children into the house. The woman with the coins is a mother trying to get her kids to come home. You know, it's a shepherd trying to keep the flock together. Okay, see that's that powerful thing in Luke 15.